Hey everyone, the SHIB Show is going international today. Our guests are based in Norway and Tanzania. Up first, our conversation with Johan Olaf Koss, Olympic champion and founder of Right to Play. How's it going? I'm good. How are you, Maya and Alex? Great to see you again. Good this to is, see uh, you. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for joining us yep. today. I love this. Thank you. So I'm from Oslo in Norway. I'll make sure to put that in your bottom uh, right-hand corner so that it looks super professional like a real news program. Absolutely. <laughs> you see at the uh, uh, late night show from Oslo now and morning <laughs> show in LA. I love this. And we still have the sun up, so we can uh, we we uh, we kind of have the same type of weather. We had a beautiful sun uh, Sunday, which in Norway is very rare. Thank you so much for scheduling this, even though it is so late, despite it being still light out. One of the benefits of being in Norway this time of year, or is it not a benefit? Is that actually difficult because you're trying to go to sleep and it's bright outside? No, 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 no. It's lovely. Okay, it's good. Unbelievable, <laughs> because you come, you feel. I mean. Of course, sun, it's one of the greatest part for your mind, you know, for your healthy mind. And having a late night, you can sit outside, you can enjoy an evening. And, and the, the, the hardest part is to get the kids to bed. But uh, other than that, uh, we love it. Thank you, Johan, of the uh, Visit Norway Tourism Board. <laughs> <laughs> I will say there is a lot more to see here. We have fabulous... Uh, mountains and coasts and you know fjords of course and uh, now you can still uh, go skiing actually because there's a lot of snow in the mountains i'm convinced alex we have to go sometime right right for sure but wait johan just mentioned skiing maya he's not a skier you're 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 not a skier right johan could you give us an intro i was gonna say that you know my skiing abilities has improved later in life uh mm -hmm. Though my skating, uh, not like you guys, but um, I was kind of, I made the easy one. I went straight forward first, left on the long track by myself, literally, in a speed skating suit. That was what I enjoyed the most when I was young and enjoyed uh, the Olympics in 1994 in my home country here in Norway. Uh, back in those days, uh, we, we, we really had a tremendous, a tremendous Olympics and experience, obviously, which I, I, as I always say, I had a good week uh, skating here on my three distances. And sorry, yeah, you've got to be a yeah. little bit more specific. A good week means uh, medals, if I'm <laughs> correct. It's a three gold and uh, three world records uh, in that week of three possibilities. And the, the, the fun part was the 10,000, which is the longest distance and the last race I was did. I broke the world record with 13 seconds, which nobody had done before. And I won by 18, which is almost half a lap, which, uh, which was the largest victory margin since the 1952 Olympics when another Norwegian won three gold, also in Norway, in Oslo. So, uh, so there was, that was fun to repeat a legend like him uh, at the time. That's amazing. A, a legendary story. I like how you use words like fun and enjoy, but whenever I talk about you, I'm like epic, insane, like crazy accomplished, but you're just very humble. Well, Maya, thank you so much. I mean, I'm, you know, um, now it's just many years later, you know, we, you kind of have to experience that life goes on and a lot of new exciting things happens in life. And, but it's always good to memorize and, uh, you know, uh, I have four kids, very young, they're between three and nine years old, and I, I make them watch the YouTube uh, video every Friday. Uh, <laughs> every single Friday, they have to see my races, and the only time, um, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> How old were you when you started speed skating? I was uh, seven, uh, actually. I, I got like this... Um, it's interesting, speed skating in Norway was very popular back then. It wasn't a big sport, but it was popular. And I, had, I was lucky I had a track only a couple of kilometers from my house. And I think I thought my parents were so, they didn't skate, but they were so enthusiastic about skating. And I thought, oh, I should try that out. And I really wanted to. So I wished for skates for Christmas and I got them. I ran off to the track immediately. And I was uh, well taken care of by a coach. He was 19 years old. And he was responsible for the skating school for the youngest. And I was immediately entered into that. 
um, he became my coach uh, at the age of seven and was also my coach during the Olympics in 94. Wow. So he, I stayed with him uh, my entire career. I had the other national coaches in addition, but he was my club and personal coach. And probably, you know, uh, as together with my parents made, made the person I am. And that's why I'm so passionate about coaching and people who are, and why it's important to have coaches, but also why, as you guys know, right to play, why we're working on developing coaches all around the world. Exactly. And so we're here actually, in addition to talking about all of your accolades and accomplishments, uh, to talk about Right to Play, the organization you founded, which is, I guess, technically another accomplishment. So um, would you mind telling us about Right to Play and how it all started? Well, it's interesting because it's a very uh, sport story, actually. It was leading up to the Olympics in, uh, in 94. So two things. It was like I had a passion. I wanted to do something bigger than myself, and, but I did not know what, what it could be. I had no idea. And, uh, and I was studying medicine uh, so because my both parents are doctors and, of course, I'm the oldest son. I had to become a doctor. I was really believing I was going to be a doctor. And I became one, but I never practiced. But So I was asked to become um, an ambassador for a program related to the Olympics so called Olympic Aid, which was initiated by Norway, the organizing committee. And this was because of the war in Sarajevo. I mean, as you you guys might not remember, but it was like a big civil war in 92, just at the time uh, around the Barcelona Games. And Norway was the next Games in 94, and then they wanted to give support to children affected by war. And I asked to be an ambassador, and I was like, yeah, I'd love to go. And then they expanded because of the Olympics five rings. There should be one support area in one region. In addition to Sarajevo, Eritrea was picked, which is a, was a conflict with Ethiopia for 30 years at the time. And I was asked to go to Eritrea. And I would think, okay, speed skater, as you can imagine, going to Africa. Um, I was worried about absolutely everything. Like, okay, what am I going to eat? Where am I going to train? This is before the Olympics. I was going in, okay, I'm going to go and make some videos, going to make this good uh, story so everybody support it. But I was more worried about myself, not knowing that the trip was going to change my life. Like it totally um, gave me a perspective which I never expected. Like, and it gave me a purpose. Uh, it's a purpose for me as a skater, which was interesting because at the time I was also kind of wondering, like, is it good enough to be an athlete? And because I felt like I was you know, in the bubble, I was always training, always thinking about myself. And I realized the changes to me as a person became more and more egocentric. You know, you're thinking more and more about yourself, of course, because everybody else are there around to support. Mm -hmm. One thing I realized was sport is incredible critical for society, for developing democracies, uh, developing safe societies, and of course, the individuals in the society. I mean, you guys know all about that. And I met... One day I met this, I was, was in Asmara, which is the capital. I met this group of boys and they were like so active and fun. And I couldn't really understand it. But through a translator, they were one of them. I was asking, why is he so popular? And they all laughed at me and said, can't you see at long sleeves? And I said, like, what do you mean? Well, uh, well, he there and he took off his shirt, ro rolled the shirt together and the sleeves made a knot. And that's how they had a ball. And that's how they could play soccer in the streets. And they didn't have a ball. They didn't have anything. But they, 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 they're just a game. The, the play itself was so critical. And I felt like an athlete, wow, think if I can do something uh, with sport, like if I can use sport as a tool for development of children, this will be like a meaningful way to skate around the track. I mean, uh, and that it really gave me a higher purpose than my own achievement for gold that I could do something, just support the Olympic aid campaign and the kids I met in Eritrea. And that's how it all started. Of course, many years later, a number of Olympic aid campaigns, which was in the 90s with the Olympic organizing committees, I realized that nobody actually used to support itself for development of children. And, and that's why I found the right to play. And I said, you know what, uh, there is nobody doing that. The United Nations didn't want to do it. Um, they didn't have the, they thought it was luxury. They thought it wasn't a fine. The IOC and the Olympic movement said, we are, we are hosting the games. It's too much to do other things. So I said, okay, somebody has to kind of create a global organization. And uh, all arrows was pointing at me. 
And that's when I took the decision in 2000 to establish Right to Play, which became like the extension of Olympic Aid back then. That's amazing. I, I love the story about the long sleeve shirt. Well, I mean, this, the, the whole trip I had and the first time I met it was just life changing in some ways. I couldn't, be, I can't believe I'm still talking about it. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's 27 years ago. Um, and it's um, that story and the number of other experiences I had on that trip really formed me as a person. And you'd never think that a week can make so much difference in a life, but it did for me. And I think it was because my mind was in a very strange place because, you know, as an athlete, and you know, probably this much, I mean, Olympic athlete preparing for the Olympics, everybody thinks your yeah, motivations is endless. It's like, there's like an energy endless, but it was, it's not, you know, you meet tough days and your hard days waking up and you're, and you don't, you question yourself why you're doing this and why am I going through all this pain and that kind of stuff. And through that pain and all those questions, I, I found something which really lifted my personal motivation. I always say it to other athletes, I say, you know, having a greater purpose will make a better athlete, literally. Mm -hmm. That's what I found. And a better person. I'm sure that after you return from that trip with your training, uh, there's like probably a sense of gratitude that made the problems of your day to day and your training life in preparation for the Olympics uh, gave them context and maybe allowed you to set those world records or you're just like a superstar and you were going to set those world records regardless. But the trip <laughs> then just like informed uh, you. It's, life. You know, it's interesting you say because my national coach, when I came back, he was like, you know, you could be a nicer person. <laughs> I was like, well, I wasn't nice before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's better. You, you, I mean, I mean, it's interesting when you're under such a pressure and you're you're feeling it. It's it's so many things uh, coming together at the time before the Olympics. You kind of feel there's you know small little changes creates an up. You become upset. You get you know you feel like your your mind getting out set outside. You have to handle it. And of course, the people you're closest to, you're always the one who has to takes the largest brunt of that changes, you know, and, and, um, and it helped me put things in perspective for sure. Mm -hmm. And it was actually interesting because re really just before the games, um, I was extremely unsure about my own performance and that I could actually achieve what I wanted to, or even close to what I, my potential were. And then... Um, a couple of things was put in place. One being, you know, are you, I, am I going to okay? Is it okay for me to fail? And, you know, will it be still be something I could be good at after, even though I failed what I tried the most and hardest at? Uh, and I could, had to kind of find something and find yes to that. And of course, medicine was a very big part of that part. And the second thing was, well, if I win, what, what should you do with it? Like, and then, of course, um, at the time, the Olympic Aid, which is now right to play, was was my my channel after i won the first medal goal and then i was going into the second race i'm saying if i win this i'm going to give away all my winnings and my bonus i'm going to focus everyone on the fight the kids having because the kids fight is much much bigger than what we, what i ever gone through just for survival and for their rights to play and i mean i had not expected then you know at the time as you know, we didn't have any social media or anything, but the, the incredible support we got just from a press conference saying, I want to support Right to Play with my money. And I challenged the Norwegian to give about a dollar each for every gold medal we have. We won 10 gold medals in Norway in that game. And, and we raised like, um, I think, 18 million US dollars uh, in a very short period of time. Yeah. So you mentioned that you founded Right to Play in 2000. So that's been, that's 20 years ago. How have you noticed Right to Play? How has it changed and developed over that period of time? Well, it's, you know, interesting because I was very kind of personally impacted by children affected by war. And I wanted to help refugees. And we started early on in the refugee camps. And I'd seen the model which I felt worked really well, which was kind of getting young, talented individuals who had a sport or a physical education background to take one year of absence or leave and be kind of a Peace Corps volunteer in our organization. And we, I recruited like hundreds and hundreds of them to go in the field and, 
we worked with the United Nations, we got access to the camps and we saw incredible enthusiasm, motivation and, and, and changes and participation in itself was great. Uh, but there was something interesting, so, as you asked, what the changes over the time, what we found was after a while, we needed to go around in the communities around the refugee camps, which many of them also are, have a lot of needs and need support. So we, we realized that, you know, any country where the development index is very low, we, we needed to help. So we expanded into communities around them, we expanded into the further countries, we grew, and then... People coming to me, like they were talking to me about the model, like why do you have this piece, the volunteer coming? Like I've been going through this program now. I know better than the next volunteer coming. Why don't you just hire me? And we got into a big change in the organization saying, you know what? These people are so talented. They can do it. They just need capital. They need, we need to transfer some of our capital to hire them to take the responsibility and build the programs themselves. And after that, it was just, wildfire i mean we got the greatest talent people working day and night and they were long-term employees and it just really expanded from community organization to schools into refugee camps orphanages children living with hiv aids we did the health campaigns i mean there was has been all over and of course now as we see it it's um, it's probably one of the most powerful tools for learning for children as we have developed our programmatic impact and now one ministry after ministry in the in the countries we're working is taking on our curriculum basically our program and using play to learn which uh, when you have big classrooms with a large dropout in the in the, with the children lack of teaching teachers education this is super uh, tool for fast engaging and long-term quality education and now like we just secured a five-year contract with lego foundation in for the Ghana um, ministry and it's going to build you know i think it's like ten thousand teachers is going to be educated in Ghana over the next years through our program which is like thirty thousand schools or something and it's like wild numbers and 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 that's it's just incredible gratifying to see what that story from the child in Eritrea with that made up ball, how that can transform into millions and millions of children's life. There's not a country in the world that's not affected now. And, and we feel it in our own country, like, even how important education is for children and how difficult it is when you don't have the school mm-hmm. and when you don't have your own children go into school. My own children was home, homeschooled by me and my wife and trust me, they wouldn't last long. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we see this and then knowing that there are over 250 million children in the world who doesn't have access to school. And more than half a billion children have poor quality school. You know, drop out, many men, hundreds of million dropouts before the, uh, the seventh, seventh grade. A mm. lot of, particularly lot of girls. So I would say, you know, to Maya, I mean, listen, what we can do to get girls in school, stay in school, play is critical not only because it's a creative way to learn but it also gives tremendous uh, self-esteem self insights and self-respect which again hopefully leads to a, a hopeful like a realization that they can do something in the future and that they're worth something and that's the drive they have to stay in school and learn quality over time and as i said the world is going to be a much better place if we have more women educated and girls educated throughout the world. Because as we see through this COVID crisis, for instance, where we have female prime ministers and leaders, uh, they have handled the situation best by any uh, anywhere. So we should have more women in leadership roles. I agree. That's the only reason why I've gotten so far in life. It's because Maya's been there every step of the way, <laughs> holding me up and pushing so me lead, forward. Leading you, yes. yes, so Maya, yes, yes. Maya we, we, are, we are looking to you now for the insights and the, the smartness here, you know. Leading me, dragging me, it's the same thing. No, oh, sure, Alex. But I think that you said it so well, Johan, because it's not just about protecting the next generation and educating them, but by doing all those things through play, you empower the next generation to believe in the potential of of their future and what they can do for each other. 
So that's why the work that you've done is always so inspiring and impactful. And that's why we want more people to know about it. Well, thank you. I think, um, I think, you know what, I would just re recommend anyway, if I can recommend a video on your, on your YouTube channel, like to put a link to V Rice, uh, our video from that, because it's, uh, it's kind of tells the story about how children rise up from adversity and how through the empowerments to the education, they realize that they are have self-worth and can stand through it. So, and it's, it's interesting because life skills, I think we all talk about the 21st century most critical element in life for success. Soon, I mean, the machines took over our need for bodies and soon AI and, and the computer is going to take over our need for our brain. So in a way, our emotional intelligence and ability to relate and build relationships and our creativity will be the most critical factor human clients have. So life skills uh, is going to be what we're going to value it should, for the future. And that's play. It's what you get from it. And sport, play, uh, in all sorts of forms. I mean, play in a broader form, of course, also through music, theater, and other ways of play but if you leave that part of the society and i i think we actually interesting with the covid 19 situation now we sense it and feel it like if we don't get i mean the importance of just physical activity itself but uh, the the we see the children and how it affects mental health uh, in our own children who doesn't get access to play to their own you know what we took for granted they're just going over to the sport field and play and have fun and play with their friends and and build a relationship and struggle when they lose and enjoy when they win or when they have a fight or how they get over it. Yeah. How can people help you and right to play? Well, in these days we have as every organization having difficulties because we normally organize events for fundraising. What we're doing now, we are doing appeals, online appeals. We're doing, webinars we're trying to get people to understand what there is can any type of um, support is extremely valuable at this time we we see um, the probably the biggest effect that i know the americans are extremely affected by the covid but we haven't still seen the mountains of problems we will we will face in africa and particularly in the refugee camps when the virus is being hit and uh, there are other issues like even starvation, lack of access to medicine and support. So here there is a lot of things we need to do for the children and right to play is up in the forefront and trying to help uh, to protect and educate children and youth uh, in this crisis. So we are extremely appreciative of anyone who can help us. Sounds good, Johan. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. So late, uh, you know, go out and enjoy still, that sunshine. Look outside. <laughs> it's still sun. Uh, we, we're still enjoying here in Oslo. And uh, thank you for you guys. Have a great day in LA. And I'm looking forward to catching them. And Maya and Alex, thank you so much for being so great athletes ambassadors for Right to Play. You are leaders and you are wonderful, wonderful people who has given us so much support over the years. And I'm so proud of being in your team. Thank you. Thank honored, you so to, honored to be a part of the same team. We hope you guys enjoyed our conversation with Johan. Up next is Patrick Nieko, a Right to Play program director in Tanzania. Unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, we weren't able to use the majority of the footage from our conversation. But Patrick was awesome, and he recorded the answers to our questions, and we've included them here. I joined Right to Play in August 2019 because of two main reasons. One is because of the unique approach of the organization and that is play. Right to Play uses play for learning and development. The organization innovatively harnesses the power of play to protect, educate and empower children. Um, secondly, it's because of my passion for leadership development. I strongly believe that everything will rise and fall on leadership and therefore um, investment in, in, in leadership development is key if we want to uh, see sustainable development in communities in which we currently serve. The most urgent need for us here in Tanzania is to close the gap in information regarding COVID-19. Many of the communities, uh, especially in rural areas, do not know how COVID-19 is transmitted, how they can prevent its transmission. 
um, what are the available services that exist for them um, in the community and how they can access those available services. This information is lacking. And therefore, as Right to Play, we joined the National Task Force responding to COVID-19. Uh, we are active participant in the Risk Communication and Community Engagement Subcommittee. This committee is tasked with the responsibility of developing media communication leaflets regarding COVID-19. And uh, our role as Right to Play in this uh, committee is to ensure that this information is uh, child-friendly and engaging. The reason why we want this information to be child-friendly and engaging is, is because um, in many of the communities where we work, especially in rural area, now, the child might be the only member of the household that knows how to read and write. And therefore, if this information is not uh, friendly, it's not uh, uh, engaging to a child, they might not take interest in it. And therefore, their parents might miss out on the most important information that they need to help them prevent um, COVID-19 and to, and, and to protect and keep their children safe. Even before the crisis, uh, many of the communities um, that we, we, we work in um, face a lot of challenges, especially for girls to access education. And, and, and with this crisis, with school closing, um, uh, girls uh, are at a greater risk of not returning to school. So as we pass information regarding COVID-19, we also want to continue to sensitize the community that education for a girl child is important, that even after the crisis, they need to ensure that these girls go back to school and, and, and continue with their learning. And so that is key for us that a girl child is protected, that a girl child is allowed to continue to, to, to engage in learning even while schools are closed, and that once school reopen, they should be able to um, return to school and, and continue with their education. We really appreciate that Patrick took the time out of his busy schedule to share how he and his team are continuing to work for children during this challenging time. Thanks for watching this episode. To learn more about how you can support Right to Play and their work to protect, educate, and empower children around the world, visit their website and follow them on social media.